This podcast includes explicit content. Listener discretion is advised. Hey everybody, welcome to your latest episode of the Earthseas Podcast Meets, where we sit down and chat with fabulous people who we think have something interesting to say. Whether that be authors, artists, activists, sex workers, you name it, we've met them. The Earthseas Podcast. First of all, like, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Liara Vru. I'm a sex worker organizer and I also am a pornographer <laughs> like do you have any specific uh, website or platform yeah um, you can find my work at liararu.xxx and I post pretty frequently on both uh, Instagram uh, Tumblr, Twitter and Reddit okay nice so Liara uh, I would like to start with like an overview of like the legality of sex work in the US. I understand that it's not fully decriminalized, but uh, yeah, would you give us a little bit more insight about it? Yeah, so sex work in the United States um, is legal in one state, Nevada. It's illegal to do sex work or um, full service sex work across state lines. Um, I think porn is only really legal in California and one other state. I think it might be New Hampshire, um, but people will shoot porn anywhere. Um, it's not really strictly enforced. I think there's in the United States, there's a lot of weird laws about um, sex work just because there's so much shame associated with it in American culture. Like I think especially compared to European culture where there's like, often nudity and just like advertisements like women's breasts will be like fine in public whereas in the united states people um are a lot more like just weird about sex in general <laughs> okay so would you say for example that in many cases like sex workers like operate in this sort of like a uh, gray zone of legality or like or so Yeah, yeah. A lot of sex workers um, are sort of forced to, um, yeah, exist in this space where they they may provide services that are illegal, but sort of skirting the law by advertising their services differently. Yeah, it's like because it's illegal, people have come up with all these techniques to do sex work, but do it in a way that um, doesn't get them caught by the law, which is really interesting. How does, like, the internet uh, affect sex work? Like, having, like, counting, like, counting on the internet and web platforms, what is the influence on sex work? The internet has made sex work a lot safer for a lot of people. People who used to have to work on the street or um, pick up men in bars are now able to work Um, so that clients contact them either by email or by phone or by some other method. Um, and that way they're able to screen them before they meet them and make sure that they're like a safe person. I think before, you know, it was a lot harder, um, to tell whether or not someone, you know, might be like violent or have bad intentions, but now we have community blacklists that you can search pretty easily online. Um, and it makes it a lot less likely that you're going to end up in a, a bad situation. So in like, will you say that as an overall thing, like the internet has been, a, has had like a quite positive effect on sex work? Yeah. And I think it's been really valuable for the community too. A lot of sex workers feel isolated because of the stigma and criminalization associated with our work. And so being able to talk to, you know, like an in-person sex worker can bond with a porn performer over the stigma or like talk with a stripper about how they have to sort of toe the line between like what is legal and what is illegal, like worry about stings from cops. Um, and I think, yeah, just bringing everyone together and like being more of a community has been really valuable um, and made, made people safer, not only, from violence, but safer in that they have this community that they can rely on in times of crisis as well. Mm -hmm. 
So we finally have a sponsor. And this is none other than Erstis. That's right. The Erstis podcast sponsored by Erstis. Who would have thought it? This means if you want to see what our day job looks like, then head to erstis-podcast.com slash erstis. That's E-R-S-T-I-E-S. Check out the video and follow the link and you'll receive 50% off your first month. Please note that the content is 18+. plus. One last time, erstis-podcast.com slash erstis. Click the link, 50% off your first month. And you must be over 18. Now, back to the pot. What, what does it mean, like, for you to be a sex worker? Like, in sense of, like, for you, like, to pick, like, this work, um, like, what does it bring to you? Um, sex work has brought a lot of freedom to me. I think before I worked in tech um, and I was working in an office, and it was really stressful. And the people I was working with, like, and treated me differently because I was a woman. And so I think being able to be in a job where I am my own boss and I have a lot of control over when and how I work um, while still like making enough money to like pay for my medical expenses, which unfortunately I have a lot of and take time off pretty easily. Like I can probably just like take a whole month off. It would hurt to lose the income, but if I had a health issue that really needed it, I could take the time off and then go back to work when I was recovered and ready. And it's not only helped my health, but it's helped my stress levels just because I know I have that security and that this job will always be there for me. I, it's like, it's really interesting that you mentioned this because I think there is for as many people, there's like this like kind of like common point in which that, Sex works al allows them to fit, whereas in other, like, more conventional spheres of life, it's just not happening. Yeah, yeah. I really feel like sex work did, like, save my life. Like, I don't know, like, if I would be, what I, if I would have been able to survive without it just because it gave me the flexibility that I needed to really heal um, and take time to, like, take care of myself. That's really good to hear. Yeah. Well... Could you please uh, explain what uh, SESTA and FOSTA are about? So SESTA is ostensibly about trafficking. The, the way it was explained to lawmakers um, was that it was a bill to prevent child sex trafficking. But the language of the, the law isn't actually about trafficking at all is just about the 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 word that they use is prostitution and so that also affects um people who are consensual sex workers um and a lot of the people who voted on it didn't even know that that language was in the bill it had been amended to have that uh changed and when we went in or when i went in for sex work lobby day um, to talk with um, some of the aides of the people who voted on the bill. Yeah, they just, they had no idea. They thought it was just like a, a trafficking bill. They had no idea that it would affect people who um, are considered to be engaged in prostitution. Um, and so it's really frustrating. Um, the, the bill was pushed through really quickly. And so sex work advocates didn't really have time to respond um, and lobby and try to, like, change people's position on it because it was just, yeah, like, everyone, it, the the Democrats and Republicans were arguing about so much, and they just wanted, like, one thing that they could pass and agree on and say, like, wow, we did it. <laughs> and so it's too bad that that ends up hurting a lot of people in the most vulnerable positions in society. And I think a large part of the bill, um, the reason people were saying that it had to be passed was because... It was needed for Backpage to be taken down, but then Backpage ended up being seized by the Department of Justice before the bill had even been signed into law. So that was completely bullshit. Um, and so SESTA is really just a way to try to further push consensual sex workers underground. Yeah, it's a completely despicable bill, and it's really frustrating that it passed. So, for example, like this, like this lobbying uh, meeting that you have, were you able like to talk like face to face to Congress people, or is that is that correct? 
Um, so I spoke with their aides. Um, I spoke specifically with Nancy Pelosi's aides. Um, the name of one of the people I spoke to was Reva Price. She definitely listened really well. She took a lot of notes. She focuses on healthcare, so we focused on how the bill would affect, for example, like transmissions of HIV. Um, because like when people are working in more vulnerable conditions, it's harder to enforce condom use. And so that obviously affects transmission of STDs. Yeah, she, she didn't, um, know a lot of the statistics about, um, how decriminalization of sex work actually reduces HIV rates because then sex workers are able to enforce their own boundaries more effectively and can go to the police and and feel less shame about going to health workers and being honest about the work that they do. I think getting more information out there about like the statistics behind the decriminalization movement is going to be really important. Do you think like they actually like had like a clear like idea between like the difference of trafficking and and sex work and like consensual sex work um i'm honestly not really sure they didn't provide us with that much information they were mainly just there to listen to us and like hear what we had to say and take that back and like think about it which you know <laughs> i don't know if i want to hear their like misguided ideas about <laughs> sex work anyways so yeah it was nice to just be there to educate and to not really um necessarily have to like talk about like their preconceived ideas so so what do you think are like the like concrete like motivations behind like these laws like uh why do you think it was like put like into work and uh, why on this time like did they had to just like come up with something some bullshit law just to be able to reach like some sort of agreement uh, in, con in congress or what do you think it's uh what? so we were um When we were at Sex Work Lobby Day, before we went out um, and started talking to people, um, one of the people we were organizing with said that one of the aides had actually uh, told them that sex trafficking bills are like teddy bears. Everyone wants one. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think sex trafficking especially of children is something that everyone can stand against. You know, like I, I think it's despicable and horrible. I don't think children should be like sold into sex slavery. I don't think anyone really does, but when it's conflated with consensual sex work, which is something that prohibitionists have been doing for years, um, then it becomes a lot trickier to navigate. And I think consensual in person sex work is, sort of the first thing that these prohibitionists had in their targets. But I think they definitely want to move on to porn next. They've already started using language suggesting that porn is exploitative and that a lot of people in porn are trafficked, um, which, while I'm sure very occasionally happens, it's really not the case for most people who are in porn. Most people who are in porn, you know, For some people, it's just a job. For some people, I know, like, it's, like, I personally love doing porn. Like, it's one of the most exciting parts of my job is getting to be on camera and, like, have, like, really intense, amazing sex. So, <laughs> yeah. And who are these groups? Like, is it, like, within government or is it just some sort of, like, uh, religious organizations? Or who are, like, these kind of groups, like? Um, so a lot of them are religious. There's a lot of like, especially Christian organizations that are focused on ending sex trafficking. And then there's also a lot of quote, like rad femmes. Um, and rad femmes is like a term for, um, feminists who often have, um, beliefs that are sex work exclusionary and, um, trans exclusionary. And so a lot of these, Uh, people, they seem to get off on the idea that women are being tortured by having sex with men. Like, it's, like, the way they write about it is just so, like, vivid and, like, intense and weird that it, like, it makes me and, like, a couple other people think that, like, wow, this is, like, their weird, like, sexual fantasy that they have. It's, it's really disturbing, like, how obsessed they are with it um, and the way that they insist that anyone... Um, who claims to enjoy their job is just um, like lying or like a, actually like a pimp and like <laughs> um, 
it's hard for me to say what motivates them. It just seems to be like hatred of other women. Um, you see this a lot when they're bullying trans women too. have autonomy and make their own decisions about how they want to live their life. They seem very interested in controlling women. Uh, and they have certain ideas about how, what women should want and how women should live, um, that don't really align with, um, like what real human living women like actually want. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, that, 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 that's something, that's also something that I'm thinking about because, well, like, I think that if you read a little bit of like on the topic and so there, you will, you often come with the fact that some of like the so-called like facts or statistics about even like trafficking and numbers are pretty much like misleading or sometimes they're oh, just yeah. like fabricated numbers and so. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot, a lot of these numbers are hugely inflated, and some of the numbers are so ridiculous that if they were actually true, like there would be more people trafficked than like are actually like alive, like in whatever state that they're in. It's like if this many people were being trafficked, it would like drastically increase the population, and it's just like there aren't the population numbers for it for it to be real. So it's just like, yeah, it's really befuddling and perplexing that people actually believe and perpetuate these things. But I guess preventing people from doing sex work keeps oppressive power structures in place. Like when women are able to have access to capital and not have to be reliant on a man and are able to, you know, earn their living their own way, um, then it completely fucks with this idea that men like own women and should be able to do whatever they want with their bodies because sex work is a woman or any any person um setting a limit with their body saying like oh you can only access this if you pay and then being able to profit from it and you know more traditional power structures like marriage like a woman often didn't have a choice about whether or not she wanted to get married or not. Um, she had to in order to survive because only men had access to capital. And so when you look at it that way, sex work is really transformative and uh, really powerful, which scares people who are invested in the way society works right now. And I also like think, I mean, like for me, it makes absolutely no sense that even if you're like concerned about like, the tra trafficking or the possibility of it, like, why would you, like, make, why don't you, like, protect then sex workers to be able to yeah. tell, like, ones from the others? Yeah, and when you look at it, too, like, I've definitely known people who are in abusive relationships, and I've known about it, but, like, I couldn't tell anyone about it. I couldn't go to the police about it. I couldn't do anything about it because I knew if I went to some like state-based authority figure, then they would arrest the woman. They would put her in a dangerous situation or possibly jail because they, because it's criminalized. And I think that's really important to know is that like criminalization hurts trafficking victims. Like and it enables trafficking too um, because it's pushed underground. I often hear that there are like some like uh, anti trafficking organizations who are like uh who are actually like uh advocate for sex workers rise right. Yeah. I'm I'm blanking on the names right now, but yeah, there are definitely multiple organizations focused on helping trafficking survivors that realize that consensual sex work is completely different and um have sort of yeah, they they've realized that the best way to prevent violence against uh, people who are being trafficked is to decriminalize sex work so that people who are being trafficked can be like saved more easily. Like since Backpage has gone down, a lot of trafficking organizations have been really upset because they no longer are able to search for like, like Backpage made it really easy to search for trafficking victims. And Backpage itself, like, even would give this information to the FBI. Like, if they saw a pattern, they'd be like, hey, guys, like, you know, like, fix this. But now that Backpage is gone, it's a lot harder to find people because they're on the street. And doing a quick search on an Internet website is so much faster than having to walk down a street and gain people's trust that way and, like, try to help them. Like, it's it just requires so much more work. 
now that like a uh, foster and sister like, have been signed do you know what have been like the toughest um like consequences of that that they're like being yeah i think the most immediate um consequences um have been sites sort of self-censoring before the law even was passed like i think reddit or before it was signed into law like reddit took down a bunch of sex working um subreddits twitter had always been shadow banning sex workers but i think um they sort of stepped it up a notch after uh sesta passed um instagram started censoring uh sex workers talking about sesta fosta like those tags were just like complete like you couldn't search for them nothing would come up it's ridiculous how how quickly it happened to take effect and i think a lot of places are scared too um like desiree alliance yeah they had to cancel their conference um which they usually hold every year in new orleans that is a place for sex workers to gather and talk about their rights um, because they were worried that it, they could be arrested and that their organization could be taken down um, for hosting such a conference, which is completely devastating to the community. I had a couple of close friends who went and they said it was a completely transformative experience to be able to be surrounded by so many other sex workers and to not have to be afraid and not have to hide and to have like, just this really energetic, uplifting experience of being together with the community and working to like help protect each other. And so when that's taken away, it's, it's really hurtful and harmful. Wow. So like, for example, um, like in these laws, like what could like possibly be like something that enables like trafficking? Because it seems to me like it's like the law, the law has been signed and there's like at this moment, like so much panic going on. That yeah. it's like shutting down conversations, like shutting down websites. Are there like any clear guidelines, or is it just like um, more like uh, like obscure, and you just like have like this fear, and then you just like, stop doing things out of fear, or what's what's the deal? Yeah, the law is very vague, so a lot of places are acting out of fear right now, just because they're worried about the potential consequences, um, which is really dangerous, um, and. Um, the EFF and ACLU have both pointed out that it's incredibly stifling for freedom of speech concerns because people are afraid to speak out for fear of criminalization. Um, it creates this absence of dialogue about what's going on. You think like sex and foster have also like trigger like other forms of like discrimination and so? Like, we'll just say that. I think, like, not too long ago, I was reading, like, something on Twitter about this, uh, this Christian groups, like, talking about, like, trafficking and abortion rights. Oh, yeah. That's, that's one of their, their newest, uh, things is that abortion enables trafficking, um, which is completely terrifying. They want to make abortion illegal because they claim that, trafficking victims are being forced to have abortion by whoever is trafficking them. And personally, I think that number is so low compared to like people who access abortions for health reasons or for personal reasons. Um, and I think it's completely disgusting um, that they're using trafficking survivors as a tool to further control women. And how about, for example, like uh, migration topics? Have you read Sex at the Margins by Laura Augustine? It's a really great book. And in it, she it, it radically changed um, my views on migrants doing sex work. A lot of people who are supposedly trafficked and arrested in these trafficking stings, um, you know, were moved across borders consensually. Like they like they knew that they would get into a debt for being moved across the border um, without documentation. Um, and they're okay with that. Like a lot of people, if they're uncomfortable with the idea of sex work, migrants will choose to do cleaning instead. And most cleaners aren't called trafficking survivors. Like somehow people are under able to understand that that's like a decision that they're making. Um, but yeah, with, um, sex work, people realize, hey, like, you know, instead of doing cleaning or some other like menial labor, I can instead do sex work, earn that money a whole lot faster, and then be able to like pay off that debt. Cause they, this person helped them out. They don't want to skip out 
on paying this person who's been able to move them to a new country. Um, so they want to like pay back their debt. They want to be able to like support a family. Um, and the easiest way to do that as an undocumented person is often sex work. It's really high paying compared to a lot of the jobs that are available to other undocumented migrants. And well, it's also like here in, in Germany, there are like these organizations that are like of swerves. And then like, yeah. even like they get like quite xenophobic in the sense like, well, if it's like a migrant, why do they come here in the first place? Yeah. It's just like blatant, like, yeah, like xenophobic and racist. And it seems to be like just uh, justified because it's sex work, you know? Yeah. I'm just curious about what's like the intersection of like the migration agenda and all like this trafficking discourse like if it's like something that can just like push f push it further as an excuse for like uh getting tougher on migrants and so yeah yeah i think a lot of the people who hate sex workers also hate people who are migrants probably for the same reason because uh they're sort of destabilizing to this like heteronormative like white culture that they want to maintain um and so i think especially when you have like badass like queer women who aren't afraid to break the law and like go across a border and like aren't afraid to break the law and do like sex work um that scares people because they're like wow these women are like really powerful and like aren't afraid to like do whatever they need to do to make their life better Yeah, it's just, like, inherently scary to people. And when I say women, I shouldn't be saying women because, like, there there are sex workers of all genders. Um, and, yeah, some of the most badass people I know are, like, non-binary non sex workers who are just, like, deciding to, like, totally rewrite the rules of sex work to do it in their own way. So speaking of that, like, what have been, like, the forms in which uh, the sex worker community has organized Because, of course, like, these measures are, like, super, like, dreadful. And I, I mean, like, my impression, and according to what you said, like, they really pushed these, like, laws, like, so fast that they didn't leave, like, that much time for the community to organize in a way that could have, like, impacted, like, more, um, like, the decision-making. So now, for example, that this has come into effect, like, what have been, like, the forms of organizing within the community? So I've been organizing with Survivors Against SESTA, which obviously was created as a response to SESTA. I've been talking with some of them, and we want to see if we can make it a more, like, long-term sustainable thing. Because right now, um, there's a lot of, like, direct aid organizations, which is really awesome. And there's a bunch of, like, places that um, have, like, very specific purposes But there aren't that many organizations that are very general and very flexible and aren't really, like, focused on, like, one city that are just, like, there um, to provide information and, like, organizing tools. Um, and I think Survivors Against SESTA could be that and could um, be really helpful in that way. And that's something I'm really excited about. Um, I'm also considering starting um, a nonprofit that focuses on studying criminalized sex, Um, with a focus on sex work, because that's probably, like, sex that's, like, criminalized the most heavily right now. Um, but I want to really connect um, the way queer sex was often criminalized in the past and compare that to how sex work is criminalized now. So I think there's a lot of parallels. Um, and I think as people are realizing that criminalization of queer sex Um, was bad and wrong, that people will be able to understand how restricting how people are allowed to, like, have sex and make decisions about how they want to do things with their bodies is, like, really, like, evil. <laughs> so, like, for example, now that you mentioned this, like, do you think also, like, these laws and so, like, uh, Do you think it could also like pose like some like a uh, like heavy risk for other forms of uh, of sex work? Like for example, like if you're talking about like strip like strippers or like webcamers or even like for doing like porn, that will this uh, like affect, for example, like indie porn companies? Mm -hmm. Like, do you think this could like also like affect this? Or yeah, I mean. Um I think the law was written so broadly that it would make it really easy for it to affect people because especially now that websites are using machine learning to 
like do a lot of their moderation. There's a lot of similarities between like how like different sex workers advertise. Um, and so I can definitely see a porn performer being labeled mistakenly as an in-person sex worker and then no longer being able to advertise on like a site like Twitter just because um, an algorithm has decided that she is like not suitable or he is not suitable for public consumption. Do you think, I mean, because I mean, at this point we'll be talking mostly about what, what's seen like for sex workers with this law. And so what uh, do you think like there are like any like consequences like for the rest of like of like ordinary people and so because like these laws are like so intrusive oh absolutely i mean craigslist personals already went down um and as sex workers are pushed off of other platforms they're going to move to other ones um and so i already know people who are advertising on like for example tinder and okcupid and other dating sites um and so what happens when someone is you know, like arrested for working through one of those sites. Now the that site is liable. And I don't think there's any way that their algorithms are really going to be able to catch up to like sex workers um, because sex workers are going to figure out how to outsmart them. And so, yeah, I think this law could not only limit sex workers ability to like find sexual partners but it could limit um civilians too as like dating services go down i already know a friend of a friend um was t talking about how um she was no longer able she was like having a awful dry spell she was like i'm so horny like since craigslist personals went down because like that was how i found people to fuck and now that that's gone like i have no idea how i'm gonna get laid <laughs> like you know like people don't think about how um sex workers are on a lot of these platforms already and like what could happen if they go down how can what's the best way for people to like support uh sex workers or like put like pressure on decision makers against these laws Yeah, I think people should um, do whatever they can to educate themselves. Um, I have a bunch of uh, links on my Twitter, especially, that are very informative if people want to check them out. And then start educating others. Um, and uh, representatives really do listen um, to the people that they represent because, you know, that's the people who are voting for them. And so if people start showing up and, like, calling Um, emailing, texting, writing letters, like that's a huge deal, especially on like a local level, like on the state level. If you contact the people who represent you and tell them that this is an issue that's really important to you, like if enough people do that, they'll really start to listen. And I think that's how um, the change is going to get made by like people um, educating other people, getting people to care, and then um, for those people to actually like stand up and actually support people. And do you have, like, for example, like any names of like organizations or media that are like that you recommend for keeping an eye on further developments? Um, I think Survivors Against SESTA is definitely a good organization to watch. We're going to try to keep people updated about what's going on and how they can help. Yeah. And Broadly, actually, um, which is an offshoot of Vice, has been doing a lot of really good sex worker reporting. Um, they did a really good um, article about when all the sex work protests were going on. Um, so I think they're a good place to watch too. Did you have like anything else that you would like to add, like some uh, advice or anything that you would like to add to this? I guess if people really want to support sex workers, um, one of the good ways they can do that is just hiring someone, like either hiring an in-person sex worker, going to a strip club or paying for someone's porn. Like all of those are really important. Um, and, Reducing the stigma around doing that is also really important. Um, and it's a great way to treat yourself, too. So, <laughs> Yes, totally, yeah. like, normalizing. And... Yeah, like, I, I've hired a sex worker before, and it was really amazing. I think everyone should do it. It's like having a therapist. <laughs> yes, totally. Totally. Well... Thanks for listening to another episode of the Erste's Podcast Meets. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you like to listen. New episodes come out on the first Friday of every month. And if that isn't enough, there are more of these Erste's Meets specials coming your way. Follow us on Twitter at Erste's Podcast and you won't miss a thing. Ciao. This 
Thursdays Podcast.